Hello, I'm Karen Ridges and today we're going to be meeting with Ian Tolhurst. Now Ian has been a certified organic grower for more than 30 years and he is a pioneer in organic stock-free techniques. So what are stock-free techniques? Well simply it's a way of growing organically without the use of animal products. So there's no bone, there's no fish, there's no blood. But more surprisingly there's no animal manure either. So let's go and meet the expert Ian and find out some more. Hi Ian, lovely to see uh, you. How do you do? Excellent. Now I'd like to ask you some questions. Uh -huh. How do you grow without using animal manure? We have a stock-free farming system. We don't rely on any animal inputs at all. And the basis of what we do in terms of building fertility for soil is really from the green manures. And this is what we have here. This is lucerne. This is a, a very useful crop. We've got a mixture of lucerne and we've got clover and we've got some grasses here. And this is fixing nitrogen, fixing energy from the, the earth, from the air. It's putting organic material back into the soil. It's bringing nutrients up from deeper down. And see the hole I've dug here, if we look inside the hole, uh, looking at the soil, we've got these very long, very long tap roots. This is a lucerne, which as you can see, goes way down. This is very deep. This root will go down maybe two meters or more. It's breaking up the soil. We've got lovely friable soil here. Earthworms, you can see there's a huge population here of earthworms. Um, they're healthy looking, they're active, they're very clean, they're breeding, and they're helping to break the soil up, introduce air, process all the organic materials, take the green manure down, release the nutrients. And within that soil, you can't see it, but within every tiny little bit of soil, there's thousands, in fact, there's millions and millions of microfauna. And these are microorganisms which help the whole process of releasing nutrients and energy for plant growth. So Ian, I understand you've got 17 acres here and it works on a rotation system. That's right, yeah. So out of the 17 acres we've got seven year rotations. So we've divided all the land up into one seventh of that. So it's just over two acres each plot. And each plot occupies one whole year of the rotation. So what we've just looked at is the green manures which occupy two whole years of the rotation. And then the, f the first actual cropping year is potatoes. This is because potatoes demand the most fertility so we've got very high levels of fertility after green manures. So we're cropping the first year with potatoes which is what we'll be looking at here now. Okay so these potatoes have all died down now because it's the end of the season but these were planted after the two year lucerne and clover and uh, we'll see what we've got here. There we are. This is uh, a red potato, this is Romano. Uh, nice finish, um, nice looking potatoes. There's a few small ones there. And this will provide us a crop of potatoes which should last us right up until April next year. So it's a long-term crop. As soon as this crop's finished, we're, we're actually lifting all this now at the moment. As soon as all these potatoes are gone, all this land goes back into a green manure for the winter. So it's covered with another cover crop, green manure cover crop, which would be a type of clover, a different type of clover. And that sets it up for the next year, which is going to be brassicas, that's the cabbage family. So we've got this continual cycle of green manures cropping, green manures cropping. But the most important thing really is, is making sure we've got a long-term fertility building crop, which is lucerne and clover for at least two years. And we've got cover crops during the winter, so land is never bare. Bare earth, earth such as this, if it's left bare, loses lots of nutrients. You can see the soil is in very nice condition after the two years of green manure. It's very friable, uh, it breaks down very easily and it's got a lot of organic material. What have we got growing here, Ian? Well, there's two things, Karen. We've got these very tall, wonderful Jerusalem artichokes. You can see they're, they're taller than me, they're a couple of metres tall. And we use these as a windbreak. This reduces the wind speed across the field. But it also adds uh, a lot of biodiversity. Alongside this, we've got this beetle bank. It looks a bit messy, but this is a, a selection of wildflowers and herbage, which is here to encourage diversity in insects. So we've got the beetle bank. This helps to connect all the hedges together across the field. So we've got a route for insects and small mammals to transverse the field. And that's aided by the artichokes, which give us some windbreak. And also we have a crop here. We can actually harvest this in the winter as an edible crop, which is actually quite popular. Artichoke soup, very nice. Why are you growing brassicas after the potatoes? Well, this is year four of the rotation. We had potatoes last year, then we had the green manure over the winter, which is um, a clover which fixes nitrogen. Because we've got a lot of fertility still here in the ground, and the brassica family like to have a lot of fertility, particularly nitrogen. 
What brassicas do you have here in the field then? Well, there's a whole range. They're mostly winter brassicas. We've got uh, sprouting broccoli over there. Then there's two or three different types of Brussels sprouts. We've got cauliflowers, a purple one, a white one, and a green one. Uh, then we've got eight or nine different types of winter cabbage to give it a long season. We need cabbage and brassica right throughout the whole winter, really. So why haven't they all been eaten by caterpillars? Yeah, a very interesting question. Um, we've got a series of parasitic wasps that live on the site. There's, there's three that we've identified. They actually parasitise the cabbage white butterfly eggs or the caterpillars when they're newly hatched. And the reason we've got those predators is the way we manage the predator habitat. So the beetle banks are very important and also allowing them to flower and uh, full, uh, go through the whole full life cycle. We always allow some brassicas in the field virtually the whole year round. That keeps the predator here on site and then it can then migrate into, into the hedges and the beetle banks then come back in the summer to control the caterpillars. We have almost zero damage from caterpillars. Do you think that's more effective than traditional methods? Yeah, it's much more effective. We don't have to spray, we don't have to use any pesticides, organic or otherwise. It cuts out a lot of effort, uh, reduces the time we have to spend on the crop. But we have to manage the whole system in order to make that work properly. So the way we manage all the habitat of the field is essential component to what we do in terms of pest and disease control. So the flowers here don't just look good, they actually have a purpose. And Ian's going to tell us some more. That's right, Karen. The flowers are very important. It's all part of our pest-predator relationship uh, balance. We're trying to improve uh, the number of predators we have on the farm to control pests. So we have a range of different flowers. It's connecting the two hedges together. We've got a hedge each end of the field. So it allows insects to move and particularly it allows insects to have an overwintering site where they can feel safe in the winter to pupate and start the process again the following year. So we've always got insects on the site. It's really about improving and enhancing the biodiversity of what we already have here. Uh, I can show you something else as well in the hedge. The hedges are very important to, to the way we farm. Yeah. So what are, the, what are the benefits of having a hedge like this? Well, there's lots of different dimensions in the hedge. At the bottom, we've got this strip of uh, wildflowers and grasses, which we only mow once a year. We don't keep it cut short. Uh, the nettles are very important. Nettles encourage a lot of predatory insects. Um, this is home for various parasitic wasps that live on the cabbage white butterflies and also we've got a range of different fruits uh, we've got berries um, and they'll, a lot of these fruits will go through the winter that encourages birds and birds are also very good at controlling insects so it's a multi-dimensional biodiversity if you like we've got different types of flora different types of fauna all working in the field to create a harmonious whole which is primarily about controlling pests and diseases it also looks very nice as well and also there's fruits here which we can harvest if we need to for our own personal use we've got nuts and berries mm. yeah it's relatively easy uh, it's just uh, the, it's really to do with the management how you actually manage the hedge so we don't cut it every year it's cut every third or fourth year uh, and where we have created new hedges, such as the one we have in the bottom of the field there, we'd be able to plant a whole range of different species of fruits and nuts, which is far more beneficial than just a single species hedge. So new hedges can be uh, grown specifically for your purpose in terms of encouraging the right sort of biodiversity. And we've seen a huge improvement in bird life here over the last decade as well. A very high re um, degree of different species of birds have, have are now visited the site which didn't before we started. That's really interesting. So what's next? We're going to go and look at the onions and the leeks, which is the allium family. That's year five of the rotation. OK. Yeah, if you get regular... Now, the allium family, I know, is prone to a, quite a lot of disease. Oh. How do you cope using the stock-free methods? Well, the rotation plays a very important role in this. And one of the reasons we have the alliums coming after the brassica, so we've got alliums coming in, in year five, is because of the importance of trying to keep disease down. The brassicas actually inhibit certain diseases that the onion family may get. So it helps enormously to have the brassicas first and then the alliums after that. So how do you grow the alliums? Well, all the leeks are grown from seed. We grow those in a seedbed outdoors and then transplant them into the field. And there's three different sowings. We see here there's the larger ones which were planted earlier and the smaller ones which have just gone in. The onions we grow from sets, that's little baby onions, uh, and they're planted in through a biomulch which is made from cornstarch and that degrades at the end of the season. So that helps to reduce the problems of weeds, allows us to ripen the onions outdoors. Uh, and between the onions we actually grow clover as a means of supporting fertility for the following year's crops. 
Okay, and what's next? Well, after the onion family, we're moving into the root vegetables, which is primarily carrots, parsnips, celeriac. It's mostly the umbelliferous family. Okay. So this is year six of the rotation now. What are we growing here? Well, there's a mixture of different root crops. We've got uh, parsnips, celeriac, uh, some different beetroot family, and we've got some carrots growing here. Let's see if I can find one. Um, here we go, they've got some carrots. They're quite young yet, they've still got a little bit to grow. But um, they're a very important crop to us, and uh, we've got uh, 48 rows of carrots here altogether. Oh. Why is it important to grow this particular crop in year six? There's various reasons. One is that carrots and parsnips are quite able to grow at lower levels of fertility, and we would expect to see fertility declining at this point after six years. Uh, and also they're very good at opening up the ground. They've got very long, deep tap roots, and they can bring nutrients up and, and, and water from lower down. So they work very well in the latter part of the rotational years. How do you control weeds in this part of the rotation? And is it the same for all the different parts? Um, most aspects that we control are the same. We're using mechanical methods, but also the rotation is very important. Mm. So different crops will favour different weeds. If you grew the same crop all the time, you would tend to get one particular weed predominating. Uh, we're also using this method. You can see the ground is, is ridged up here. We've got a ridge either side of the carrots. This means we can bring soil up between the plants and smother the weeds in the row as well as between the row. So uh, we try to avoid any hand weeding because that is quite expensive, but there are sometimes we have to do some hand weeding and some hand hoeing as well. Okay. We've got the final part of the rotation to go and see now. Mm -hmm. What does that involve? That's the squash and the sweet corn. Excellent. Last part of the rotation, <coughs> year seven. Yeah, this is the final year, this is the end of our seven year journey and this is uh, a crop of squash and sweet corn uh, in the same rotational plot. Sweet corn is, um, is a crop which we grow successfully, we have three or four different sowings. The squash is particularly important to us, it's become a staple crop over the last few years. Uh, customers are very keen to have squash, so we grow a whole range of different types, different shapes, different varieties, uh, different colours, make it very interesting. They store very well, they're really good for winter storage, mm -hmm. we can store them right up until April, even May, some years. Okay, that's interesting. And also, you've got all this green, mm. other green plants growing around. What's the purpose of that? Yeah, this is, um, this is a, a relatively new sowing of green manure. We've got a mixture of red clover here and lucerne. It's a mixture of red clover and lucerne. And uh, we've undersown the squash. So we've planted the squash. It's been, we've had weed control. We've got rid of most of the weeds and then we're sowing this into the actual growing crop. And this is something I call relay cropping. We're actually relay cropping green manures with a crop. And this is important because next year this will be here on its own. This will be the start of the fertility building part of the rotation. So next year we have just clover and lucerne on its own and the following year. So we've already started to build fertility at this point in the rotation. So we can have the best of both worlds. We're building fertility through the nitrogen fixing part of the green manure and we're having a crop at the same time and these squash will begin to crop in, a, in about six or eight weeks time. So we've seen some great fresh quality produce here. What happens next? Where does it go when it leaves the field? Well all the vegetables that we grow here in the field and in the garden and in the tunnels and greenhouses all go through our own bot scheme. So we're distributing locally within a 20 mile radius. Yeah. We're feeding around 400 families a year, providing something like 75% of their vegetable requirements during that year. It operates all year round. We're packing, harvesting and packing for 51 weeks a year. And it's sold through our local neighbourhood reps. A neighbourhood rep is a person who looks after a group within their neighbourhood. So we deliver to the neighbourhood and people then pick up from there. So what are the benefits to growers and to farmers using the stock-free methods? Yeah, there's many benefits for growers to take this up, farmers and growers, because farmers can do it as well on, on cereal production. Uh, one of the main ones is really optimising fertility and not relying on inputs from outside. So we've sort of almost ring-fenced our farm and we've excluded most inputs from outside. That means that there's more land available to grow food because we're not depending on large livestock units to produce the manure to do what we do. And also there's an increasing 
biodiversity benefits. We've got a big range of biodiversity here. We're seeing some real benefits in terms of soil structure. The soil structure has improved dramatically with more green manures. Keeping the ground covered means that the nutrients are being held over. We're not polluting local water courses with organic nitrogen, which can be just as bad as inorganic nitrogen. Um, so the benefits go beyond just what you see happening here in the field and also it benefits in terms of our customers are very keen to adopt the, the policies that we've taken on here on the farm in terms of not having to depend on livestock units to produce what we are able to do in terms of vegetables. Well I think that's really interesting and I've certainly learned a lot mm. today mm. so thanks for showing me around and hopefully I can maybe pop along next time. Yeah you're welcome. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> Well, stock-free organic growing simply is the way forward, and you can do it too. Contact details are appearing on the screen now. See you next time.